I wonder whether, and this is pure speculation on my part, whether Bellingham might think, well, if I join Liverpool in 2023, would I be joining a club moving in the right direction or the wrong direction? So with us for this one, uh, The Athletics' Rafa Honigstein, who covers German football for us. We've got Jack Pickbrook, who covers England, uh, and James Pearce, our Liverpool writer, who's written a big old read on the battle for Bellingham. And I suppose, uh, James, the fact that you are on is a, a clue to who we think are the favourites to sign him, domestically at least. Would that be fair? I think, I think certainly the club who you'd say um, have the greatest need and and certainly probably I don't think anyone admires him more than than Jurgen Klopp and Liverpool's recruitment staff who who view Jude Bellingham as the, the complete box-to-box midfielder um, and I think when you also when you look at what's coming up on the horizon with Liverpool's midfield needing a, a major revamp in 2023 when you've got a situation with Cater, Oxay chamberlain and Milner all out of contract. Um, yeah, I think I think that is why Liverpool's interest is so strong. But I think the caveat to that is they also know that they will have some serious competition for his signature. Although I particularly liked Raf's smile as I asked that question to James, which sort of indicated, oh, there they go, the arrogant English thinking that he'll leave Dortmund <laughs> at the end of this season. I wouldn't go that far. I think <laughs> Dortmund are... <laughs> Are, uh, are not stupid. They are aware that Jude Bellingham is probably not going to end up uh, a Dortmund legend with 500 Bundesliga games. But there is a degree of confidence when you talk to them that this is not a foregone conclusion. I think they've been in very close contact with the, with the parents and with Jude himself. And they haven't received any indication that they're desperate to leave. I think it's a little bit different to the Jaden Sancho situation where everyone knew that he was off. Uh, in the end, it was almost a surprise that he stayed that extra year uh, because I don't think they could agree uh, a fee with Man United at the time. I think now there is still the assumption that he's more likely to go than not, but there's a sizable possibility in their mind that he might be able to, that they might be able to extend with him. Of course, the World Cup complicates things because if he has a fantastic World Cup, and I think there's every chance he'll be, he'll be a starter and be very good for England, it might make it more difficult for Dortmund then to persuade him to, to, to basically say, you know, don't go too early, you're not quite ready, make sure that you go to England as a fully formed player. If he, as he has done throughout his career, kind of supercharges that progress and that development, they might not be able to keep it. I think that 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 point we should do before before we come on to England, really, which is, as I'm sure most listeners know, Borussia Dortmund seem to always sell the player at the right time when it suits everybody in the main, unless it's Bayern Munich coming for them. Maybe I I, I don't know. So, but but they seem to have grown up conversations with their players. Would that be fair when it comes to development and how long they should stay? Yeah, some players are more amenable to that than others. I think negotiations with Mino Raiola for Erling Haaland weren't that easy. Um, this is slightly different. Um, also, as an aside, Bayern Munich haven't bought any Dortmund players in seven years now. Some people in Munich <laughs> wish that they might have in the meantime, because there were certainly some really good players. Um, I think in this case, throughout this day, Dortmund have always stressed how impressed they are with both him and the family when it comes to the maturity of dealing with the situation, when it comes to having a very clear idea of what they're trying to do with him. There's never been a danger of him losing his head or the parents being you know, persuaded by agents to do something that is not right for the players. It's been, for the players, it's been from the very first moment that he got through the door. That's why I think there is, there is that slight hope still. I think under normal circumstances, we probably have would have reached a point where Dortmund feel, okay, two years to go, a World Cup coming up, he's playing better every week. That's probably the end. He's an English player who wants to go back to England. That's fair enough. That's almost kind of baked into the, the deal in the first place, that he goes to Dortmund to learn how to play, to raise his profile, to become a, a really rounded player, and then he moves on. But they're still hoping that the story might not be over just yet. 
were Dortmund surprised by the player they got or uh, how he developed as quickly as he did with them? It's definitely the latter. Um, I, I remember having that conversation of saying, well, you know, we give him time. We won't make to put too much pressure on him. Little by little, he'll get a bit more game time. But the, game, the guy basically starts straight away and then becomes a regular straight away and then becomes almost sort of the the captain of the side in terms of his importance and presence and every step along the way he is overachieving and he's quicker than than people think he is and and this is not this is not a guy sort of hurt, hitting a purple patch and sort of everything works for him this is all hard work and, and an ability and willingness to learn from the beginning they were talking about the fact that he put himself in the dressing room next to the most experienced players, not with the youngsters. He wanted to learn from them, wanted to see how they're getting dressed, what they're doing before a game, how they react to defeat, how they react to win. Always sort of soaking up information. And you can see a lot of that on the pitch. You can see how every game, in the words of uh, Otto Addo, the assistant coach, he, he seems to do what others do sort of in six months he 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 does it in in a couple of weeks time in terms of just feeding in um information and, and making sure that he he learns from his his own mistakes but also from the stuff he does well and exceedingly well uh, most of it uh let's look at the um the battle for him then james and, and there was already before he even went to dortmund i mean manchester united watched him 46 times since the age of 12. And the message that kept coming back was sign him, sign him, sign him. Uh, and then they didn't want to pay. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. I mean, you could, you go back beyond that really. I mean, he, he obviously, he obviously signed, signed for Birmingham when he was under eights and at the age of 11, that that's where Liverpool's interest kind of stems back to. He, he, he spent a few days at the Kirby Academy then and, Liverpool were desperate to bring him on board, obviously would have involved his family relocating from the Midlands to the Northwest and him going to school at, at Rainhill High School near to, near to where the Kirby Academy is. But, and Liverpool were, were, were gutted that, um, you know, after a, a couple of days there, his, his, his family decided to, to stay put. And then, um, you know, that was, and then, and then you're right, yeah, you know, at the age of what, 15, 16, when with Birmingham's blessing, you know, they obviously had well documented financial issues at the time they knew that they were going to lose him in the near future and certainly I think yeah when he went to Dortmund United were the probably the the, the biggest other option I think on the table in terms of the amount of groundwork they put into it which I think has to be factored into the race currently um, yeah he was shown around Carrington um, but yeah, there were some doubts. I think there's, you know, certainly figures at United feel like they could have done more in terms of, um, you know, really pushing the boat out, maybe financially to, to try and to try and uh, to to get to get him on board. But you know, I think the other side of that is, you know, you, I think his parents, Mark and Denise, who have you know have always, you know, carefully guided his career and continue to do so to this day. You know. I think they also, you know, forgetting the financial side, they felt that Germany was the the best step for his development because, you know, I think what they what they wanted more than anything was a uh, was guarantees over over playing time and opportunities that would follow. And you know, you'd have to say that it was it was a it was a, it's turned out to be a very shrewd next step for him. Uh, absolutely, because there there is no guarantee. I mean, Chelsea were in for him as well, Jack, but with both United and Chelsea there would be absolutely no guarantee that if he had gone there, either of those clubs would be seeing the Jude Bellingham that we're seeing at the moment. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think Dortmund is probably the probably the best club in the world for you, for making that final development step for a very talented young player. Um, you know, it's no, it's no surprise why keep good players keep going there. And I'm, I, I'm sure you're right to say he wouldn't have been as good if he'd gone into the mess that Manchester United have been for the last few years. I think it also helped that as much as Dortmund are a huge club and uh, of course there's a lot of spotlights on them in, in Germany, you're still slightly under the radar as far as England is concerned. I mean, they will recognise yeah. you 
in the big games. Uh, Southgate might come over when they're playing Bayern Munich. You see them in the Champions League. But on a day-to-day -day basis, you can basically develop as a young English player almost in peace. The local media is very football orientated. You won't get anyone taking photos of you, doing the wrong thing. I don't think Bellingham is the type for that anyway, but just generally speaking, you are being left alone to a certain extent. And again, I think for a young English player to almost leave that hype behind or park that hype a little bit is, is really beneficial. You mentioned his parents, James, and uh, when, when putting the article together here, you can throw out the, the usual suspects as, as we have done a little bit already, and we'll expand on that. But given, given his career path so far, as you say, not, not going to Liverpool and staying with his local side, but then being very open about where he was going to move next with his parents at 15, 16. And that sounds like quite a grown-up relationship with Birmingham and that they were very open and, and how they talked about it. Is there... Do you think, actually, behind the scenes, there may be an option that would surprise us all given that they always seem to do what's, be what's best. And that isn't always the case in football. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think the only issue with that would be, the, you know, who else could possibly live up to the financial side of, of trying making this a reality? Because I think, I think the numbers involved, you know, automatically rule out, uh, you know, a, a lot of clubs. To, bu know, to buy him, to, to buy, buy him. not what yeah. he would ask for, but to buy him. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, I think, I think, you know, be, be, you know, even what does he down? He'll be down to the last two years of his his current deal next summer, um, which clearly looks like you know the the kind of first available opportunity really for his array of suitors to kind of firm up that interest in him. Um, but you know, the, you know, the Dortmund value him at around 150 million euros. So what was that? 130 million pounds and. You know, the, that's why I think I'd, I'd be amazed if we saw anyone else, you know, I think probably only PSG in world football, you'd say, could could potentially come up with that kind of cash apart from, you know, the, the ones we've mentioned, you know, Real Madrid, United City, Chelsea and Liverpool. And even, you know, that, that that's why I think when you speak to people at Liverpool, the, you know, the, the, the caveat is, will the numbers get too big? You know, will, will it will it reach a point where you just go, well, hang on a minute, you know, the despite his huge potential and despite the fact, you know, you know, I think Liverpool look upon him as someone who could, you know, could be at the absolute heart of that midfield for the next decade. Um, you know, it's a, it's a long-term investment, but, you know, the, the numbers still could get crazy, especially when you factor in the wages. Barcelona might find another lever. <laughs> uh, on the, um, on the, uh, where does Champions League football fit fit into this then? With say within the first season. Yeah, well, I, I don't, I, I, I can't imagine he would, he would go anywhere that, that that doesn't that doesn't guarantee that. So um, that that's where I think when you when you look at it, the situation at the moment, there is, I, I don't think there is a any clear, you know, kind of pathway at the moment in terms of well, you know, it, it's looking increasingly likely he'll go to. To, to, to that place because I think there's so much up in the air you know you look at the issues that Jurgen Klopp is grappling with at, at Liverpool currently you know you look at you know United you know are they you know they, there's, there's obviously promising signs under Ten Hag that that you know are, are they going to be back amongst Europe's elite next season you know Chelsea again you know, you know obviously a, a lot of change there what kind of position are they going to be in next summer um, you know we know the the pulling power of City. And I thought it was telling that Pep Guardiola, you know, eulogised about him after that game at the Etihad last week, described him as, as exceptional. And, um, you know, and then, you know, you factor in Real Madrid as well. I know there was a, a Bellingham quote recently about, you know, his, his adoration for Zinedine Zidane and how he spends a lot of his time watching clips of, of him. And, you know, on the face of it, you look at Real Madrid and you think, well, you know, do they have, quite the, the the same need as some of the others when you look at you know how youthful and dynamic and vibrant their midfield is currently um but of course um you know Luka Modric can't go on forever what happens if both Arsenal and Tottenham make the Champions League for ne for next season Jack uh I can't see either of them being in the mix to be honest I just think that it's just not consistent with their policy to spend 
what would be a nine figure sum on a player. It's not something that either of them have ever done. Uh, and I imagine that Bellingham would probably rather go to a team that is, you know, routinely winning and challenging for titles and the Champions League. Where do you think he would look, Raf? I know we're speculating here, but impossible to to know. I think the fact that he came close to moving to United once gives them a good chance to to make it happen. Liverpool, as James has said looks like a very good fit. The question is, can they pay the Dortmund premium? Because we shouldn't forget that there is still a two, two and a half year deal here. Dortmund, I don't think will keep play against his wishes, but they want to make sure that any compensation will not just replace him, but actually strengthen the team maybe in two or three positions. So that brings us to a sum well, well, well beyond the 100 million euros. 150 has been mentioned. I think Dortmund would love to achieve that. Whether that is realistic, I'm not sure. But then it makes it difficult, I think, for Liverpool, even if they have an agreement, or if they get an agreement with the player, we're getting into a situation where I think the fee might be prohibitive. And then it's going to be interesting what will happen because... Dortmund are not stupid. They know that next year he will be will be cheaper with having only one year left. But how cheap, how much cheaper and will they just wait until somebody else comes around and, and pay that money? I mean, it's going to be really interesting, I think, what's going to happen. Um, I would I would think around about maybe February, March, when when these kind of moves tend to get serious um yeah should be should be interesting and because of because of the financial implications of such a move i think it's very difficult to to predict that he's going to go to club a or b because whoever will take him it is a serious outlay i mean we're talking about sort of the most important the most expensive player i think that any club has bought in recent years so it's going to be it's not going to be straightforward did you reach a conclusion at the end of the article, James? <laughs> um, not a definitive one, no, only that um, it will take some very deep pockets and a, and a very compelling PowerPoint presentation to, to win the day. Um, I think, as Rafa said, I just think it's too far out at the moment to, to, to make any kind of bold predictions on, on where this will end. I think all we do know is it's, it's going to be absolutely intriguing. You know, from a Liverpool perspective, we know that one of the reasons why they were reluctant to, to kind of throw money at their, their midfield this summer was that, you know, they their, their, their targets that they really wanted weren't available. Um, and Bellingham certainly fits into that category. You know, I was there when Klopp was asked just before the pre-season tour of Asia, you know, about the, the speculation they could have Bellingham. And he said, well, the problem is he's not on the market. Well, well, actually, that is the only problem with him. Which, um, and he gave you one of those wry smiles that that told you everything you needed to know about his admiration for him. But um, you know, and certainly, you know, Klopp's track record of developing young players, and you know, you've got the other factors like you know the, the bond that Bellingham has with Jordan Henderson from England duty. You know the um, you know the, the way that he grew up idolizing. Uh, a legendary Liverpool figure like Steven Gerrard, but you know, despite all of that, um, you know, as Rafa said, you know, it, it, you know, ultimately it will come down to the numbers and whether Liverpool can make that work. I wonder um, whether I want. I just wonder what Bellingham will think about Liverpool's succession planning and whether or not Liverpool are heading up, up upwards or downwards. Because you know, James obviously knows more about much more about Liverpool than I do, but. Watching Liverpool at times this season, that you know, you wonder if they're a team that have peaked, if they're a team in decline, if a team that haven't really managed the kind of succession planning especially well in the last few years. And if Belling, I wonder whether, and this is pure speculation on my part, whether Bellingham might think, well, if I join Liverpool in 2023, would I be joining a club moving in the right direction or the wrong direction? 